Um, so thank you for listening to that introduction. Um, and without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, um, Dr. Julian Silverman, who's an assistant professor at the Department of Science and Math at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Um, and so Julian received his bachelor's degree in atmospheric and environmental chemistry from um, McGill University in Montreal. So he's a fellow Canadian um, <laughs> and um, an MPhil and PhD at the CNUY Graduate Center. Um, and he conducted his research on conjugating lipids and carbohydrates to create soft materials at the City College of New York. Um, his teaching and research at FIT focuses on supporting quality undergrad research projects, identifying and transforming local waste biomass into functional soft materials, and also conducting life, styles, life cycle assessments to further link chemistry, environmental science, and practical action to address sustainability in the lab at home and in the community. Um, outside of the lab, he does partner with experts across the chem ed community to develop open access curricular materials and assessments for students and educators um, to contextualize chemistry and environmental science. And one thing I would really love to highlight about Julian's work with us at Beyond Benign is that he was a curriculum developer and reviewer and toxicology fellow for our toxicology for chemists curriculum that was released um, in August. And we co-hosted a workshop together at the BCCE where Julian had some really, really great advice about piloting the toxicology materials. And so please just know that he's also um, a great person to draw for from um, expertise in that area. So um, thank you, Julian. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen and you can begin your talk. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I think I think we can see what's going on. Let me just pull up the right one. Oh, desktop one, share. What can you guys see? Can you guys see my screen at the moment? I'm no, thinking I might not have permission. Nim, if I put the link in the chat, would you mind sharing your screen instead? Yeah, no worries. Thank you. And I'll just help you through the slides. With my new computer at FIT, they, of course, didn't give me the permissions, which is not surprising. So I'm going to let you share them. With that said, thanks for having me. So not only is it a Sustainability Awareness Week at FIT, so we're talking a lot about green chemistry, you may also know it's National Chemistry Week, and the theme this year is Fabulous Fibers. So it was sort of a perfect uh, confluence of these different ideas together. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my research as a green chemistry educator, so bringing these tools and resources into the lecture and lab. But then I'm also going to highlight how you can teach toxicology using these resources Nim was just discussing. And so let's start. The, or the goal for today is talk about how toxicology is always in fashion, which is right really to say that this is teaching the same chemistry fundamentals that are in your general, organic, and upper level classes as well. And so the frame that I do this with, with non-science majors, is primarily through chemical safety. So very practical things like using proper PPE, but then also understanding where the connections are to really everyday things like why you're using gloves versus goggles in a given experiment. And so to start off, let's talk a little bit about some fiber science to give you a sense of this branch of material science. Um, so I am a primarily a polymers chemist, so looking at different materials, right, made from natural, but also synthetic resources. On the left, we can see uh, a digested fiber science textbook showing the connections between different topics and words. And if anything, it really highlights the chemistry you are already teaching. Things like the properties of materials and chemicals are relevant in fiber science as well. And so then we, of course, have the connections to everyday life. People, I would hope you're all wearing some form of fabric or fiber right now. Um, students often have an interest in the clothing that they wear and the fashion that they engage with. And so some of the research I do looks at sustainable textiles. For example, you may know that uh, Americans and people all over the world dispose of textiles every year. But what could happen if we could either recycle these fibers back into monomers or even recycle them into reusable clothes? And so an example of my work is taking natural materials like waste iron and tannins from plants and over dyeing clothes that either weren't sold or might be thrown away. You can see the fabric swatch in the middle here is an example of over dyed fabric. So taking waste textiles and turning them into new different materials. And then of course we apply the scientific perspective and method to right, understand why these materials have the color and properties that they do. You can see some really pretty uh, cellulose acetate fibers on the right. 
those nice crenellations or sort of ridges are coming from the extrusion process. And on top, we have these nanoparticles, which are giving us that deep black color. So right, we're intriguing the students with these macroscopic ideas, the things they interact with every day, and then we're connecting them to these scientific principles to teach the fundamentals of your course. Let's go to the next slide. And so from here, we wanna uh, connect this context, the fiber or fashion science, to this idea of green and sustainable chemistry. So to kind of highlight the difference between toxicology, which I think of as safety in the moment, right? Should I drink this? Should I wear this? Versus the big picture of green chemistry with sustainable chemistry over time, we have a lot of different tools. So primarily in this talk today, we'll talk about toxicology as it relates to where chemicals go and the impacts they have. On the left, you could see a model of putting a toxin into an environment and figuring out which box it partitions into. But we also look at things like circular design and the circular economy, where we talk about where materials come from and where they go. Now, regardless of what you're interested in, toxicology or green chemistry, we can use the scientific method, which we're already doing in our classes, to essentially list different ideas, map and see how they connect, and then most importantly, make recommendations or suggestions on the materials we use. Now, we do this every day already, right? You choose what outfit to wear based on the weather, for example, but we can connect these to sustainable ideas as well. And so that's what we'll do today. I'll talk a little bit about how I do that in my own work, and then we'll do a short activity where you can start to connect the principles you work on in your class with these resources as well. Let's go to our next one. So some of my work looks at taking local waste renewable resources, so things that, again, are abundant and all around us, but also chemically useful. So in a recent lab that we'll do also at the end of this semester, um, we take uh, essentially acorn caps, so not the seeds, which squirrels could be eating or humans, um, but we take the waste resources like leaves and caps to create dyes for different fabrics. Now, the other half of this work is using what's known as a mordant, which connects the dye to the fiber, sort of helps it bite in. And generally or historically, we use things like tartar emetic, which is an antimony compound, and generally is not as safe as some of the more sustainable resources that we can use in teaching labs. So for example, tartar emetic was one of the first mordants used to take Perkins mauve color and attach it to cotton. And as useful as that is, uh, you can see here that the low LD50, which we'll talk about in a moment, indicates that it might not be the safest choice for a teaching lab. So instead, what we did was develop from waste resources, literally the old scrap metal, scrap iron in our labs, um, a yellow iron pigment that you can use instead to generate that yellow or orange color. And so right, highlighting these alternatives, especially for teaching labs, but then also in the research that we do with students can help them understand that it's not out of reach when it comes to bringing sustainability into the work they do. And so to connect this on the next slide to the very evident principles of green chemistry, right, we can see how different aspects of these works or labs that we touch on essentially connect to different green principles. So I always think of green chemistry principles as the through line or sort of the threads of the experiments that we do. And by highlighting how these relate to the different components like the resources of feedstocks, alternatively, the products we create, creating say fabrics or dyes that can be purposefully degraded, right? They're not persistent like plastics, for example. And then also safer mordants touches on how green chemistry principles, it's not so much a checklist of numbers, right? To get correct, but instead are these ideas that are sort of synergistic and can come together to create a more meaningful lab. This is what we might call like a systems thinking perspective, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. So let's jump to the next one. I think it should be after that. So the way that I do this, right, connect different contexts like fiber science, and then also the resources that are available to us, like the Talks for Chem program that Nim was speaking about, is by using this process known as backwards design. So this is totally borrowed from the educational resources community. And the premise here is that first you're identifying the goals that you're probably already doing in your classes. So these would typically be learning objectives that are maybe either given to you from other instructors that have taught your course before. These could be at the top of your textbook chapters, often they're literally spelled out, or you can of course be creating a new class and creating these for yourself. So in a moment, we'll talk about how you might link fiber science and toxicology but know that clear learning objectives are always a great start to any kind of curricular content. 
The next thing we'll do is identify how learning objectives can connect to the variety of modules that are in the Talks for Chem program. So I'll show you the list of different modules we have, and we'll start to make connections between the things you're already teaching and the resources that we're going to provide to you. And then last but not least, the most fun to me is coming up with the creative things that students can do. So this could be writing out a lab report, right? The activities might be group work in class, or you can start to think of more creative assignments. One of the ones I had a lot of luck with recently was having students use safety data sheets to create advertisements for chemicals, almost like you'd see in a CNEN magazine. And so what we realized is by not focusing on what it will look like to begin with, we have these core goals and principles that lead us through the entire work. So let's sort of step through these steps one by one. I'll show you some examples, and then we'll try to come up with ways that we can do this together. So again, I always like to start with learning objectives. Number one, because my institution requires it. On the right, you can see that SUNY, which is the uh, system that my school is part of, has these sort of gen ed requirements that we're reaching. My guess is that your school probably has these too. Um, I know, for example, they're called Common Core or Course-Wide Objectives, but the premise here is these are really fundamental objectives for any science course that you're working on. And so it's no surprise that these objectives might be sort of modified or tailored to the specific class you're teaching. On the bottom left, you can see three of the learning objectives for my Chemistry for Cosmetics class that I teach at FIT. We have a lot of fun in here teaching about the um, both sort of Gen Chem 2 topics like solutions and mixtures, but putting them in a sort of generic framework so that students can use them regardless of their background. And so it's probably no surprise that these objectives are well suited for a variety of different courses. And so now what we'll see is how we can link these different ideas, which again sort of work up Bloom's taxonomy, going from simpler things like identifying names of chemicals to then complex things like making recommendations and using online resources. And so on the next slide, what we can see is the list of different modules that the Talks for Chem program has really provided you, not just things like lectures, but also activities and homeworks that you can connect to. So just in case you're a little scared to teach a new topic like toxicology, um, you don't only have to right, learn these different ideas, but there's a lot of good sort of resources to get you started. So linking the learning objectives that I have in my class to these modules, what I try to do is think about the best connections between these different topics. And so on the next slide, we can actually see I sort of mapped out on the left a couple of learning objectives. And then what I do is I try to think about the activities that students would have to do to really show that they've learned and understood these different objectives. So for example, if I want them to begin to identify best practices for handling a chemical, well, if they're using safety data sheets to compare reagents, maybe based on PPE or maybe based on uh, LD50s, for example, that to me shows that they're beginning to master these different objectives. And so know that you don't need to have an activity for each one of these. In fact, a well-rounded activity might tackle several learning objectives at once, but maybe in different stages throughout the activity. And so you'll notice here, I've identified a couple different modules for each objective. Usually I use one at a time, but it's helpful to see that they're sort of not only interdisciplinary, but connect to these different fundamental ideas. So my guess is that in a course that you're teaching, you could use different resources throughout the semester to kind of hammer home or reintroduce the same ideas uh, a couple different times. So let's look at our next slide. This is a specific example. So a very popular activity that we did in our first lab this year is uh, Tom Kunzelman's uh, dyeing with really Gatorade or things like Kool-Aid, which is a lot of fun. It's obviously very safe. Uh, but the way that I framed this activity this year was because it was their first lab, and because they're not science students, we actually pretended that this Gatorade uh, powder, which is totally safe to handle, right, you end up drinking it usually, um, was hazardous or toxic. So in the first lab, they're learning to use proper protective equipment, not out of fear of the actual chemical, but for further chemicals we'll use. They also practice disposing of these chemicals safely, and of course, talking about different ways that they would test to see if a chemical might be harmful. So traditionally, we dye the fabric swatches on the right side of the screen, but this year we also had them dye fabric and weave them into a bracelet so that they could wear that over the next couple of weeks to see if there's any adverse reaction to the chemicals they used. Now again, we knew these chemicals were safe, but this is the kind of practice that um, weavers and dyers use to determine if the fabrics and dyes they're using are safe to handle. And so what I did was I took a resource that was already provided, Tom's work here, and I just brought it into the world of toxicology. And so now let's see how we can do that. So today's activity, which you're not required to do, but it's not so bad, is to first think about something that you're trying to teach in your classes already. 
This could be a topic like stoichiometry. This could be something very specific like naming organic chemicals. But maybe you can think about something that you have difficulty working with. And I invite you to put it into the chat. We'll have some time to talk in just a little bit. And so to show you how we're going to structure these learning objectives before we map them and then suggest activities, let's look at Bloom's taxonomy again. So on the next slide, we can see this pyramid. And if you've never seen this before, it's sort of a model for how students work from very basic ideas like right memorization and remembering names, for example, all the way up to really high end stuff like creating a suggestion or a procedure or a new product. And so to work our way up this pyramid, usually we want to have learning objectives that address a couple of different areas. With that said, you're going to choose a verb from any one of these levels to create your learning objective. So for example, when I wanted to bring toxicology into my class, I wanted to make sure students could analyze different chemicals. And so for example, one of the learning objectives I might come up with in the drawing connections among ideas line was this idea of right, comparing and contrasting uh, the safety of different dyes or chemicals. And so I always start with these verbs and they're really clear. They give students an idea of exactly what they're doing, right? They're executing, they're differentiating, they're appraising. And so once we have these clear learning objectives, we're then going to be able to connect it to really the interesting content that we have. And so on the next slide is something we've already seen before. These are just those 12 modules and the Tox for Chem uh, kit that you can download today if you'd like. And to help you out, I've kind of linked these to a couple different common courses in the higher education world, things like lab classes or inorganic chemistry. So I have to admit, many of these are interdisciplinary, so you want to look through them and see what's best suited for your classes. I'll tell you that in a non-majors introductory course, I really stuck in the first two modules, which are both basic enough for anyone to understand, but also specific enough to chemistry and toxicology that they are relevant to what we wanted to do. And so by teaching simple things like, again, LD50s, the lethal dose of a chemical, um, we're able to start to bring in these really complex ideas, um, but in a relevant way. So take a moment to think again about one of those things you want to teach in your class, maybe something you're struggling with, maybe something that works well, but you want to update. Is there perhaps a module that you already know could link to what you're interested in? And if you're not quite sure, I would again invite you to totally download these resources. You can parse through the lecture decks, you can look at the overviews for the modules and start to see where these connections are. And so on the next slide, we'll see an example of this. So these are two very different kinds of activities that I did in a sort of second level um, chemistry for toxicology course or tox for chem. And so one of them was definitely more interactive, what I found to be more fun. It was a murder mystery, right? So we're talking about uh, different doses of chemicals and perhaps the types of hazards that they have. This was an introductory um, example that I did just to you know, kind of break the ice with chemists who weren't as familiar with toxicology. But really by the end of the course, these same students were doing high level work. So what we call alternatives assessments, comparing different ingredients and in consumer products, sort of a simple life cycle assessment. So a way to evaluate the inputs and outputs of creating different products that we use. And so know that the resources in Talks for Chem allow you to go from that very introductory level with definitions all the way to this very high end level of creating resources and recommendations, which honestly is a challenging thing to do. And this is just the beginning of, but then allows chemists and non-chemists to really branch into that world of toxicology. And so know that right, all these available materials are online. But if we head to the next slide, we can see that we've already written up a bunch for you as well. So for each of those modules, there is a companion homework or assignment. Many of these would be seen as like a, a take home problem set for a traditional college chemistry class. But we can also see sort of bigger picture life cycle assessment and final project style reports and modules as well. So again, if you're a little, you know, wary about how to throw this into your course, you're welcome to incorporate a single module, a single assignment, or you could think about adapting, right, multiple modules for a course. Um, Scott, my colleague up at uh, South Dakota, actually did an entire course for his undergraduates, and he's been teaching that for a couple years now. And so on our next slide is really the end of the talk portion. Um, some of the best practices that uh, I can recommend as someone who, right, several years before this wasn't really aware of much of this toxicology, I was more on the green chem side, or number one, to use what you have. So I'm going to guess that you already have lesson plans that work for you. You have some learning objectives that, you know, are required or prescribed for your courses. 
And you wanna build from those. We don't wanna push those all to the side. And so the next thing you can do is connect with the experts in the world of toxicology. And you can do that directly, but these are also people we've incorporated into the modules we've built. So it wasn't just chemists creating these slides and lectures, it was also toxicology experts, um, people like Saskia Van Bergen, you know, for example, works with both nonprofits and also companies to make sure that their products are safe. So know that you're having help even if you're using the resources and not directly connecting with others. And the last part is that the dose is the poison. This is one of the prime ideas of toxicology. And so you really don't wanna overwhelm yourself at first. I would totally advise not creating a brand new course to begin with, but again, taking one learning objective and maybe one module throughout a pilot semester so you can then see what works for your students and doesn't. And honestly, there are a lot of other digital resources online. The Society of Toxicology, which is similar to the ACS, has literally lists of learning objectives which you can connect your to very easily. And I learned a lot of this background on Tox Tutor, which was essentially an online textbook for my students. And so with that, I'm gonna pause for just a couple questions. I wanna invite you to not only follow me online with some of the fiber science and work that I do, but also invite you to build on these, right? You're gonna hopefully take these resources and make them your own. And so as they change, we invite you to share with us uh, the new developments that come, not only for your students, but also for the research that you do as educators. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, okay, any questions for Julian? You can feel free to um, unmute um, or you can pop a question into the chat. I have the chat open. Um, if anyone has something ready. I will say fiber science is often something that we don't think about. Right, but one thing I always have my students do at the start of the semester is right to connect the chemistry they're learning about to everyday life is to look at what they're wearing as well. And so Marta has put in the chat, how do you get past the science anxiety aspect of teaching to non-scientists? So I'll tell you, this is something I think about every day. So I'm primarily teaching marketing majors in a cosmetics program. So they may end up as formulators or as people right, um, doing quality control or checking different products. And so really what I try to do is bring their passion out and connect it to what we do. So a little aside from the fiber stuff, right? A project that we're doing currently is they're identifying active ingredients in the products that are on their shelves and cupboards. And from there, they'll go backwards to using safety data sheets and then talking about these toxicology principles. So definitely when they're not chemists who I know have a clear focus on chemistry, um, I find bringing out what I know they're interested in is very helpful. Now, I know often as non-majors classes, we might be teaching to a less homogenous group of students. And so the other thing I often do on the day one is ask them what their interests are. And so things will pop up like they're interested in baking or cooking, and you might do more of a, a food side of this. Um, but nevertheless, I find once you start to ask them what they're interested about, it starts to come quick and you can build up uh, from there. I have a question. Um, I was reading up on alt galls, which is it strikes me as pretty much the same idea as the acorn caps. Um, I imagine acorn caps are a lot more available than the oak galls themselves. <laughs> um, do you have any feel for the comparative effectiveness of oak galls versus acorn caps? Do, do the oak galls have a bit more? I know people have used that for thousands of years, right? Iron gall ink is this. Are the acorn caps just as good effectively or, or is they a little less? Absolutely. So the oak galls do have a higher concentration of the tannins. So they're definitely a better source when you're making ink and selling it. But for the students, I find the caps are not only easier to find, um, but they're just as good at creating the dye, more for a hands-on experience. Um, but I'll tell you that they sell powdered oak gall in like the pigment stores down the street. And I don't know if our students are fancy enough for that yet, maybe for a, a second level project. Thank you, very interesting. And there's um, one more question in the chat. Um, I don't know, Julian, if you can see the question. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's see, do we provide samples for students to test or do they bring in samples to test during activities? So we try to keep a pretty, pretty traditional science lab in that it looks like almost an organic lab where they're taking chemical reagents and using them. We do have a couple labs where we use things like acorn caps 
Um, but then we also try to compost those resources at the end rather than just dispose of them in the waste. Um, so it depends. Primarily, we're bringing the resources to them, but then we host things like workshops where you can bring in a t-shirt, like a cotton t-shirt, and dye those as well. 